Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Credits and Incentives for Food, Beverage, and Agribusiness Companies. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams. Star Fisher, partner, Shane Griffith, senior manager, Gabriel Thermano, senior manager, and Liddy Steele, manager. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shane to get us started. All right, thank you, Emily. So today we'll be starting our discussion with the partial sales tax exemption for manufacturing R&D and uh, electrical power generation. So this is, it's important to note, this is a separate exemption from the agricultural partial sales tax exemption. Um, we won't really be focusing on the agricultural exemption today. You know, our experience is that most Agribusinesses are familiar with that exemption and already taking it, but we do have materials on that exemption. If, if anyone is interested, we can provide those materials upon request. Uh, so, you know, it, it's important to keep, uh, you know, distinguish between the agricultural exemption and the manufacturing R&D uh, exemption because they do apply to different activities. They do have different sales tax rates. Uh, there can be different documentation that applies, so you'll want to track the use of those exemptions separately. It's, uh, you know, the effective rates for the partial exemption. Uh, California's had the manufacturing and R&D exemption since July 1st, 2014. They've had the partial exemption for electro uh, electrical power generation since January 1st, 2018, so it's a more recent addition to this exemption. Uh, just a high level kind of on, on, on the applicability, uh, it applies to machinery and equipment, tools, and special purpose buildings. Uh, we'll go into more detail on, uh, on those items a little bit later in the slides. Uh, the reduced rate is approximately 50% of the state rate, so there's definitely a, a good benefit. Um, it's important to uh, distinguish between the state rate and the local rate, so there are districts that impose local taxes, and this exemption, this partial exemption, only applies to the state rate. Usually the, the district tax will still apply in full. Uh, the exemption applies to purchases of qualified property by a qualified person in a qualified activity. Those are all defined terms, which we'll get to uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, there is a limit, $200 million of qualified purchases per year per person in the calendar year. 
So it's a pretty generous threshold. A lot of companies won't hit that, but if you do feel like you're approaching that $200 million mark, uh, it's good to track to make sure you're not taking uh, the exemption on purchases in excess of that amount. Okay, so the definition of a qualified person. Uh, a qualified person is a legal entity or establishment, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the business as, as a whole that qualifies. It can be some aspect of the business, some department or cost center of the business that can qualify for the exemption. Uh, the, uh, you know, California looks to uh, the NAICS codes that are provided by the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, and so if you want to evaluate whether your activities fit within any of these qualified activity categories, you can go to the U.S. Census Bureau's website and look at the descriptions of, of each category. So looking at research and development, the NAICS codes are uh, 54.17.11 and 54.17.12. And those are specific to biotechnology and, and physical engineering and life sciences. Manufacturing, the NAICS codes are uh, 3111 through 3399. Um, when we're talking about the uh, you know, manufacturing, we're talking about a process that uh, begins when raw materials enter the process, uh, the manufacturing process, and ends uh, kind of the final stage of when tangible personal property has been altered to its completed form, which can include uh, packaging. Um, and then agricultural businesses and electric power generators, uh, these are NAICS codes, uh, you know, 22111 and 22118, and then 221122. And that, again, was just added recently, uh, or fairly recently, January 1st of 2018. So what is a qualified activity? I think, I think the key here is that uh, you have to spend 50% or more of your time uh, engaged in a qualified activity. Uh, California, I think, fortunately gives a, a number of options in how you kind of uh, evaluate whether you meet that 50% test. Uh, you can look at revenue. Uh, you can look at operating expenses, prior year employee salary, uh, salaries and wages, prior year value of production, uh, the number of full-time employees. So you have these different uh, kind of metrics you can look at to determine whether or not you meet this 50% this test, but you are required to meet the 50% test in order to take the exemption. Uh, as a best practice, we do recommend that you document your, your kind of your methodology for arriving at this 50%, um, whether it's kind of even just an email or a memo to the file. Um, sometimes it involves a little bit more of a, a complex calculation, but that you are maintaining that documentation uh, contemporaneously with uh, taking the exemption so that if you're ever audited, you have something to kind of support, uh, support your position. So, so looking at the specific property that can qualify, um, again, you have to meet this 50% uh, primary use test, but the cate general categories are uh, machinery and equipment, and this can include components uh, or replacement parts. Equipment and devices uh, used to operate, control, regulate, or maintain the machinery. You know, in some cases, it can include computers or special tooling. Again, the, the emphasis is more on, you know, just different types of devices that can operate or control or maintain a machinery. Property used in pollution control, um, provided it meets certain uh, state standards. And then special purpose buildings. And I think pur uh, special purpose buildings is probably the area we see people uh, often missing. Uh, it can be pretty significant depending on the uh, kind of the size of, of, of the construction project or the build out. Um, the way it works is that if, if uh, your building meets a 66% qualified activity test, then the entire building can qualify for the partial uh, exemption. Uh, even if you don't meet that 66% test, specific components or portions of the building can still qualify provide they meet all the other criteria. And then just some additional requirements to, to emphasize, again, you have this 50% test in a qualified activity. You also have a useful life requirement of one year or more. Um, so we're not looking at consumables. We are typically looking at fixed assets. But uh, something California has been clear on is that uh, it is kind of a strict one-year test, even if you're, you, know, you don't capitalize assets unless you know, there's a five-year useful life. 
Um, that doesn't necessarily determine whether you take the exemption. It really is just a, a one-year uh, one test. And then finally, on the, the California exemption, uh, qualified use is defined as uh, any stage of the manufacturing, processing, fabricating, refining, or recycling process, includes research and development, includes making, uh, producing, creating, or converting electrical power from non-conventional power sources, uh, maintaining, repairing, measuring, or testing any qualified property, and materials or fixtures furnished and installed by a construction contractor. So that, that kind of wraps up the partial exemption for California. Uh, look, moving to Washington, and just some quick background on Washington. Washington doesn't have a state income tax and instead imposes a, a gross receipts tax called the business and occupation tax or B&O tax. Um, so it's a tax on you know, gross revenue, not net income. Uh, there are some kind of nuances around how uh, B&O tax defines a person subject to tax. And so uh, something unique with Washington is that uh, every separately organized legal entity uh, is uh, potentially a taxpayer. And so you can have situations where you have a, a single member LLC or disregarded entity for federal income tax purposes that is actually a regarded taxpayer in Washington. And so this can create issues with uh, intercompany transactions between related entities where for federal purposes or financial accounting purposes, Everything is, is, is you know, essentially combined or consolidated. Washington actually treats those as separate, independent, taxable persons. Um, so uh, that's something to be mindful of. Uh, B&O tax is based on the specific activities a, a business engages in. And so there are 36 different uh, B&O tax classifications that can potentially apply. Um, the B&O tax classification drives the tax rate that you pay, uh, how your income is sourced or portioned to the state. So it's important to get that, that right. Uh, some common classifications are service and other activities. Uh, so this is uh, you know, attorneys, CPAs, architects, engineers, professional service firms. Uh, other common classifications are manufacturing, wholesaling, retailing, um, which also have their own rates and own rules around sourcing. So in addition to the B&O tax, Washington does have a retail sales tax. And just a quick comment here is that um, you know, Washington has been at the forefront of taxing digital products and services. And that applies to not only the seller of those products and services, but also potentially the consumer of those uh, products and services. So uh, you know, it, it's important for Washington businesses, even though they may not be selling uh, digital products, to be mindful that as they're purchasing those products that they're either paying sales tax uh, at the point of purchase to the seller and the event the seller is not collecting that sales tax, that they're self-assessing uh, use tax on those purchases. And this is kind of a common uh, miss we see in uh, department revenue audits that um, uh, we see businesses getting assessed on. So just being, being careful around any kind of software product or service that um, you're evaluating whether or not use tax or sales tax should have been paid. So some B&O tax uh, exemptions. Again, you know, the general rule is that all revenue, uh, gross income is subject to B&O tax, but there are certain carve outs for uh, ag ag agriculture, uh, wholesales of agricultural product by the grower of such product. You know, the key here is that the wholesale is being actually made by the grower um, to qualify. Uh, there's an exemption for receiving, washing, sorting, and packing of horticultural product for the grower of such product. Again, you want, you'd want to be engaged directly with the grower in order for this exemption to, uh, uh, qual or, uh, to apply. There's an exemption for processors of fresh uh, fruit, vegetables, seafood, and dairy products. Um, and then also an exemption for uh, certain activities performed for related parties. So again, uh, in Washington, intercompany transactions between related entities is generally subject to B&O tax, but there are specific exemptions that apply for uh, 
arrangements, you know, contract labor, farm management services, hauling for hire, provided those entities are uh, related parties as defined uh, in the Internal Revenue Code. And then there are also some exemptions for uh, certain custom farming operations, so services performed by a farmer for a farmer. So those were the B&O tax exemptions. There are also retail sales tax exemptions that can apply, uh, especially around kind of planting and harvesting activities. So there are exemptions that cover seedlings, fertilizers, chemicals, uh, replacement parts to farm uh, machinery and equipment, uh, packing materials where those can be viewed as essentially part of the product being resold, um, and feed. And then, you know, similar to the, the, the manufacturing R&D partial exemption covered a little earlier on uh, for California, there is a machinery and equipment sales tax exemption in Washington as well. It's a 100% uh, exemption, so you're getting exemption for all state and local sales tax paid. Kind of the general criteria are that it's used directly in a manufacturing operation. It has a useful life of more than one year. Uh, does not apply to hand, uh, handheld tools, but power tools can qualify. And then also applies to cer certain uh, ancillary services like repairs and maintenance related to uh, eligible uh, machinery and equipment. Uh, in addition, there's a sales for resale exemption that can apply. So these are raw materials that are becoming, uh, you know, their ingredient or component part of the final product that's being sold. And then it can also apply to packing materials, which can be viewed as part of the product that's ultimately being resold to the, the end user. And then just to wrap up with a, a few Washington incentive programs, uh, there is the, the manufacturing B-no tax exemption for uh, processors of fi uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, dairy products, and seafood products. It's set to expire in 2025. Uh, this is an uh, exemption that's been extended a couple times. Um, in the event it's not extended again, uh, the default would be to uh, have a preferential rate for that activity. So I believe that preferential rate is set about one third of the standard uh, B&O tax rate. So still a little bit of a break, but not a complete exemption if this is not extended uh, beyond 2025. Uh, the high employment county sales and use tax deferral for manufacturing facilities. Essentially, if you're expanding or building in a uh, high unemployment county, uh, then you can get the deferral of sales tax on some of the construction costs. That essentially becomes a permanent deferral if you are uh, operating that for a qualified purpose for eight years. Um, an important timing, I guess, consideration is that you would need to apply for this program before you uh, obtain your building permit. So there is some kind of planning that goes into that. There's also some manufacturing uh, eligible investment projects. Um, these are uh, kind of deferral programs, there's a limit to $10 million of cost, and there's some kind of uh, uh, additional considerations around how many projects you can have on each side of the Cascades. Typically, it's up to two projects are eligible, one on the west side of the Cascades and, and, and one on the east side of the Cascades in Washington. And then finally, the, the last incentive program here we're going to discuss is the uh, sales tax remittance program for warehouses, distribution centers, and grain elevators. And so this, again, is, is sales tax that you'd save on your construction costs of building these types of facilities. There's typically a square footage requirement. Um, there isn't a pre-application requirement, so you can, you can just um, apply. Essentially, you, uh, I guess the procedure is you'd pay tax on your construction costs as you go, and then you would separately, periodically submit uh, essentially refund claims or remittance uh, claims to the Department of Revenue to get a refund of tax that you've paid in. So that, that wraps up our, our Washington and, and California portion. I think we have a, a polling question. All right. Our first polling question, which of the following purchases may be eligible for the Washington Manufacturer's M&E ex exemption? A, hammer, B, HVAC system for the break room, C, safety goggles, or D, a great pressure used in winemaking? And I'll give everyone a few moments to respond. Participate in our polls today. Please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit.
give everyone a couple more seconds here. Let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Shane, back to you. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, most, most answer of the grave, uh, grape crusher used in winemaking, and that's the correct answer. Hammer wouldn't qualify. It's a, uh, you know, a handheld tool. The HVAC system for the break room isn't directly related to manufacturing. Uh, safety goggles, again, kind of a question of whether it's direct to manufacturing and maybe useful life, but the grape crusher used in winemaking would, would, would uh, uh, definitely qualify. So most of the audience got that correct. I guess now I'll I'll turn it over to uh, to Gabe. Great, thanks, Shane. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Federal Work Opportunity Tax Credit, um, and then jump into a discussion on discretionary incentives. Um, starting with the Federal Work Opportunity Tax Credit, this is a program that has been around for a while. So I would imagine that a, a few folks on, on the webinar are familiar with it. If not, a great way to kind of jump in and introduce you to it. If you are familiar with it, maybe a little refresher on how the program works. Um, it was started in 1996, so it's been around for a while. It's a, it's a federal income tax credit. Um, there's not really a specific eligibility from the company standpoint. As long as you're hiring folks in the U.S., uh, you're, you're typically eligible for this credit. It's a general business credit with a one-year carry back and a 20-year carry forward. So if you are generating credit, it does have a pretty long, useful lifetime um, and can be pretty valuable. It's currently extended through the end of the calendar year, and there is hopes and there is um, plans for it to be extended for at least one year through uh, a tax extender package, um, and then hopes that it will be uh, permanently enacted uh, after the 2020 elections. Um, those of you who have been familiar with the program have, have seen this be extended, uh, put on hiatus with a retroactive extension. Uh, it, it's gone through the legislative process several times, uh, so we don't expect it to be uh, eliminate it anytime soon. It just will be, you know, probably have a one-year extension that will hopefully turn into a permanent uh, inaction after the 2020 election. A little bit about how the program works. Um, it's designed to provide an incentive to employers to hire folks who have had uh, what they can, what the, the government considers traditional barriers to employment. So. It's a prospective program where the incentive is to hire folks with certain that meet certain eligibility criteria based on those traditional barriers to employment. Um, it, it is prospective, so you have to be ahead of the hiring with um, the eligibility screening to make sure you're capturing the, the, uh, the information necessary to qualify the employee for the credit. You don't get any credit for folks you've already hired, so it's important, again, to, to look at this as a prospective credit. Um, it requires the employer to screen these new hires before their first day of work. So it's important to have a system in place to screen and identify eligible employees prior to their, their first day. Um, the different ways to qualify the eligibility criteria, we listed them down at the bottom of the slide. Um, you know, it's, it can range from folks who have, you know, who are ex-offenders, who have a felony on their record. Um, it could, it, it, criteria include uh, folks that are on government assistance, whether it's food stamps, now known as SNAP, uh, whether it's uh, TANF. Um, there's qualifications for veterans, uh, unemployed veterans, disabled veterans. It's really designed to help, you know, uh, give assistance to the men and women who have served when they're trying to re-enter the workforce, you know, um, provide an incentive for employers to hire, hire those folks. So um, that screening process has to take place within 28 days of hiring, and the application for the individual to be 
uh, certified has to be submitted within 28 days. So there is a kind of a quick turnaround and administrative process for this on the front end. Once those applications are submitted, um, they're administered by the, the state WATSI coordinators um, who review the documentation, determine whether they're, the employee is eligible, and then they issue a certificate that the company can use to qualify the employee and then start to calculate the credit. Um, credit can be pretty valuable. It, it ranges per employee from 2400 to 9600 per per certified new hire. So that can add up pretty quickly if you're hiring uh, you know, a number of folks regularly. This, this credit can build, and like we said before, with a 20-year carry forward, it has a pretty useful life, lifetime. This slide, we talk about how our, the Moss Adams Max Credits uh, tool can be helpful in administering the WATSI. But I think it's also useful to kind of look at what we consider best practices when looking to uh, administer the WATSI program. Uh, there is a bit of administrative burden on the, on the front end to identify and screen uh, potentially eligible employees. So it's helpful to have a system in place that uh, is reliable and robust so that you can make sure you're capturing as many people as possible. Um, you know, you're going to want to have a system that is pretty well implemented with your, uh, your applicant tracking system or your onboarding system so that you're able to effectively screen folks, follow up with them when they need to provide additional paperwork or information. Um, you're going to want to be able to retain that documentation and information and then you know, ideally generate reports to, to, to determine compliance with the employees to make sure that you're picking up all the eligible employees that you can. Um, you're going to obviously want to be able to calculate the credit and be able to make sure that you're calculating it correctly and putting on the return correctly. Um, all those types of things need to be considered when pursuing this credit because there are a lot of ways to kind of let things fall through the cracks and then you've either missed out on the credit or you're going to get a credit denied. Um, it's helpful to have uh, the screening set up in you know, multiple languages if possible, if that reflects your workforce, um, as this is not a mandatory uh, screening process. It's voluntary, but you, know, you want to set it up in a way that's going to maximize folks' comfortability to respond to questions that are going to help you identify them as potentially eligible. Um, and then there are forms that the employee will need to sign that accompany the application. So having, you know, in the language that they're most comfortable with, in a process that is seamless within the applicant tracking system, those are all things that are helpful in ensuring that you're going to be able to identify the most people possible and also get them certified. And this slide, again, is it's it's helpful to, to outline the administrative aspects that can, can typically make or break this credit for, for a company. Um, again, the, the, the screening is time sensitive. It has to take place um, prior to their first day of work. The application needs to be submitted within 28 days of that first day of work. So there is a lot of time sensitivity to this, um, and it's helpful to have a robust system in place to help track it. Um, it's helpful to have a champion on the company side to make sure that there is somebody monitoring and following up with people, and um, not just internally, but following up with the different WATSI coordinators at the state level to make sure they have the information they need uh, to have um, somebody follow up with the state coordinators on any denials on, on first pass to make sure that you know, they're just not doing a, a quick review and deny it, that there is a reason for it. So it, it, again, it can be administrative, administratively burdensome, but I think it is very valuable. And if, we ha if you have the right system set up, 
have a, an internal champion and potentially uh, so a service provider to help you with it, it can be a, a very valuable credit. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about discretionary credits. These credits are economic development tools from the various states and, and local governments that are designed to attract and retain jobs primarily. They're designed to attract new investment, attract new companies, attract new economic activity so that they can, you know, fundamentally build their, build their tax base, expand their tax base. Um, most, most states have a economic development tool uh, in, in, in their toolbox that is designed to attract and, and, and create jobs. Um, lots of activity that can be an opportunity for a discretionary credit. Um, if, you're, if you're expanding um, your headcount, if you're expanding into a new location, if you're experiencing organic growth and it's just it's significant year to year, those can be opportunities to reach out to uh, your local or state economic development corporation and discuss potential incentives. If you're adding a new function or a new activity, for example, if you're going, if you're going to add a new regional operational center, a new food processing center or a new distribution center, and you're not sure where in the country you're going to put it, um, that can be an opportunity. Consolidating operations, maybe from the effect of a merger and acquisition activity, um, if you're looking to consolidate operations and maybe bring jobs from various parts of the country and consolidate them in one state, then that could be an opportunity. Um, it's 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 overall if you're looking to create jobs or if if you think you're going to be creating net new jobs for a jurisdiction, then there's opportunity there for you to work with the state, work with the local jurisdiction, and see if they're if they're willing to assist with that job creation by providing some sort of economic development incentive. So what do these tools look like. They can vary, um, but this slide talks about um, how we should approach the economic development incentive time frame and when it's a good time to um, begin an incentive discussion. If we're looking at site selection in kind of a three-phased uh, approach, um, it's best to start the incentive discussion as early as possible. Uh, you don't want to wait until you've decided where to locate. You don't want to wait until you've decided to sign a lease or make an announcement or you know, start hiring um, before you make that uh, first phone call to the, to the state or to the local jurisdiction. Um, Typically, in the site selection process, a company is going to look at a short list of communities where they've already kind of given thought to where they might locate. Um, that's going to be based on you know numerous criteria. Uh, if it's a particular part of the country they want to locate in, if it's got particular logistic benefit, it's close to transportation, close to rail, close to a port. However, they're analyzing their needs. They've created a short list. Um, so once that shortlist is created, if you're down to two to three to five communities, that's a good time to start talking with those communities to see if there's any tools they have to help attract and and provide incentives for those jobs for that project. Um, the site analysis phase, once you kind of dig into more in-depth analysis of those communities, um, that is a good time to also reach out. It's not too late then, but it's getting closer to the time where you really want to reach out and make sure you have those conversations to see what's available. Um, site acquisition, 
not not too late for types of certain types of programs, but if you've already signed a lease and if you've already signed or if you've already made an announcement, that's going to be it's going to limit your leverage in being able to kind of have uh, a community provide a lot of incentives. Uh, it doesn't necessarily kill all of the potential programs, but it will limit the uh, leverage you have. So I, I, I did kind of tease up what types of programs are available. Uh, they run the gamut. Um, they can be tax-based, they can be non-tax-based, they um, can be tax credits, they can be sales tax exemptions, they can be property tax abatements, they can be income tax rebates, sales tax rebates, um, they can be non-tax, they can be cash grants, they can be infrastructure assistance, com uh, some jurisdictions will, will uh, partner with the company and maybe add sewer line or add different types of inf infrastructure to support the, the job creation. Um, Sometimes some states have closing funds that'll help kind of just close the deal, uh, maybe help close that, that funding gap between one location and another to help assure the jobs come to, to that jurisdiction. Um, again, many states offer several types of programs. I'm not gonna go into them all here, but I've listed some that are available in different states. And you can see they, they run the various types of incentives from cash grants to property tax abatement to to uh, income tax credits. So um, important to note, and I'll, I'll start to wrap up with this, is that the local jurisdictions typically, um, depending on the state, will have um, incentives that we layer on top of the state program. So they're, they may not be the difference maker, but they're going to be there to kind of help add that extra piece that could be the difference maker along with the state and program. So, now we have a polling question. All right, our second polling question. Discretionary incentive opportunities include A, closing funds, cash grants, B, tax credits, C, abatements, or D, all of the above. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. And this is our second question. Give everyone a couple more seconds. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Gabe, back to you. There it is. All the above, that is... That is the correct answer. They can they can cover m multiple types of, of incentives and tax credits, abatements, and closing funds are all correct, but all the above is is more correct. So looks like it, most people pick that up. So um, very good. With that, I'm going to take it over to I forgot home to Liddy to Liddy to talk about R&D credits. And Liddy, we'll turn it over to you for the next section. Thanks, Emily. Um, so I've, I've taken a look at our attendee list and I'm Glad to say that I do see some recognize, uh, recognize some names from that list. So for those of you that we've worked with before, hopefully this will be a refresher. And um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the R&D credit and some of the opportunities available in, in the food, beverage, and agribusiness industry, um, I hope that this um, is sort of a, a high-level primer for you and maybe um, spur some thoughts about what R&D credit opportunities might be available to to you and, and your company or your clients. So our agenda for today uh, is to uh, discuss R&D credit opportunities. Um, we'll get um, a little bit into the technical details of what qualifies in terms of activities and expenses, uh, the recommended documentation to support R&D credits, 
Um, hopefully we'll have some time to go through a couple case studies of clients that we have worked with um, to help them calculate and claim R&D credits. We will touch on potential risks. Um, as with uh, many credit programs, there are some risks associated with claiming credit and end with some key takeaways. So first is the R&D credit opportunity. Um, there, the primary opportunity is in the form of the federal credit, which is a dollar for dollar reduction of your federal tax liability. Uh, it equals roughly about 7.9% of your qualified R&D expenses. So if you are, if you have $100,000 in qualified expenses, um, you would likely receive about an $8,000 credit. Um, however, that, that received benefit does vary depending on um, the gross receipts of your company, um, how, how long your company has been in operation, um, and also your, your R&D spending, um, because the R&D calculation is based off of a trend of your current year spending over prior year spending. Uh, in 2017, there was more than 12 billion in R&D credits issued. Um, that number we have seen is increasing um, since the R&D credit was made permanent in 2016. It is available for all open tax years. Uh, so broadly speaking, um, for 20, that would include 2018, the current um, tax year that we are filing this fall, if you have not filed this already this spring as well as the three prior years. However, if your company um, was in NOLs um, or losses in any years prior to 2015, there may also be an opportunity to calculate credits for those years as well and update um, and claim those credits in the form of a carry forward. It does, the credit does carry forward back one year and forward up to 20 years. Um, so for companies who are currently in losses or uh, may perhaps a startup, there, um, we, we do encourage them to at least uh, do an initial, initial investigation into what their R&D credit opportunities may be in anticipation that they will be able to utilize those credits um, in future years. Uh, speaking of startups, there is also a additional opportunity as of 2016 um, for companies in their first five years of gross receipts um, with less than five million in gross receipts for their credit year if they uh, do not have income tax liability yet, which is the case with many startups, they could claim up to $250,000 of their R&D credit to actually offset uh, the employer's payroll credit tax. And it's about 50% of the employer's payroll credit tax. So um, that doesn't benefit the employees. They still have to pay their portion of the payroll tax. Um, but for employers, there is that additional potential $250,000 benefit for startups. There's also opportunities at the state level. Uh, California um, has a great uh, credit program, uh, as does Idaho. Idaho's is, um, is slightly less, so it ends up being um, about 10% um, to a quarter of the federal benefit. Um, but there are many other states as well. The, the general criteria here, here um, for State level R&D credits is that the R&D expenses have to be incurred in that state. So if your company has operations in both Washington and California, the R&D activities taking place in California um, could qualify your company for a California R&D credit in addition to their federal credit. Um, note that there is no Washington uh, R&D credit, uh, or at least not in a, in a direct form, other than some of the credits that Shane discussed. Uh, Previously, there is an asterisk, asterisk next to Oregon um, because Oregon does not currently have an R&D credit for 2018. However, um, if you are looking at all open years, so if you're looking back to 15, 16, 17, or years prior to that, there is still an opportunity to claim a Oregon research credit um, and file amended returns to claim that credit benefit. The characteristics of companies with potential R&D credits. Um, in general, it's that the company is devoting time and resources to development of new products or um, improving or redesigning their existing products or developing 
uh, processes, patents, formulas, tech, techniques, prototypes, uh, and by developing that can be either new or improved. So uh, I know a lot of companies are engaging in um, sort of incremental improvements to their processes, those continuous improvement programs. And this does also include software um, to some extent. Uh, and another um, indicator that a company is doing R&D may be the employees um, that they have. Are they, do they employ scientists, designers, or engineers, or do they contract um, services from scientists, designers, or, or engineers? Those would be strong indicators that a company um, is engaging in R&D activities. So specific to food, bev, and agribusiness, um, where we see R&D activities is in things like new um, recipes, blends, brews. Um, this can also include um, uh, developing or farming new strains of crops. Uh, in the process improvements, um, whether that is from the growers um, to the food packers to the food processors for the finished consumer products, uh, development of equipment, um, state-of-the-art facilities, uh, again, growing irrigation harvesting processes. Um, and with that, as we're seeing more and more automation, um, also development of software programs for CRM and ERP systems um, or for the, the, con the control programs for that equipment. So with that very broad description of what could potentially qualify, we have our first polling question. All right. Our next polling question, is your company or one of your clients doing R&D? And your options are yes, no, or I'm not sure, tell me more. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download that now from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. Give everyone a couple more seconds. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Liddy, back to you. Well, great. Um, I love it that so many people are already seeing R&D opportunities. Um, I hope that many of you are, are taking advantage of those benefits already. Um, and if not, uh, please feel free to contact us, get a little additional information, uh, and see what benefits um, your company might be able to take advantage of. So next slide. Um, and so for those of you who responded with no, I'm going to try to turn you to yeses by the end of this presentation. Uh, we're gonna get into some technical definitions here of what are considered qualified act activities under the tax code and what expenses related to those activities can qualify for the credit. So the technical definition of R&D as provided by the tax code is that the activities must meet a four-part test. And by activities, um, you can think of it as the project must meet the four-part test. Um, the first of those is it must be for a permitted purpose, which is that it's intended to develop a new or improved product or process resulting in increased performance, reliability, or quality. The second is that it must be technological in nature, uh, meaning that it must rely on hard sciences, such as engineering or physical, biological, chemical, or computer science. And the third is that it, there must be technical uncertainty, activity undertaken to discover information that would eliminate uncertainty regarding the capability, method, or design of a new or improved product or process. Um, this definition, or I should say this criteria, um, tends to be where we see some um, projects start to, to, to fall off to no longer qualify or where we have the most difficulty in supporting projects as qualified for R&D. Um, the, the wording of, uh, from the tax code for this section is a little bit confusing. So I like to describe it as, was there uncertainty as to how to achieve the objective of the project at the outset of the project? Or were there challenges or issues encountered during the course of the project um, to which you had to develop 
a solution or a workaround, or in some cases, um, projects uh, even have to be abandoned if they are proven to be you know, not viable, uh, not cost efficient. Uh, an abandoned project, um, while I'm sure uh, it may be a setback to your company, the silver lining there is that uh, it's almost easier to qualify abandoned projects or failed projects as R&D than successful ones because it strongly supports that technical uncertainty requirement. So when thinking of technical uncertainty, think of questions like how or what, um, how are we going to achieve that project ob objective? What happens if we change this design? And then the fourth prong of this test is that there must be a process of experimentation. This ties back to technical uncertainty and that, that, and it is that there is a process um, to evaluate one or more alternatives for achieving the desired results. We see this through modeling. Um, so if there's any sort of CAD modeling involved, perhaps with the development of a new state-of-the-art facility or equipment, um, simulation and systematic and trial and error. So from the grower side, you may be looking at something more along the lines of systematic trial and error in your irrigation processes, um, or potentially lab testing and involving new product development. Those would be examples of processes of experimentation um, that were undertaken to resolve some of those technical uncertainties related to the project. So a project must meet um, all four parts of this test to qualify as R&D. It does not necessarily need to be meeting all four parts of these tests um, simultaneously in the same moment, but during the course of the project, there must be these elements. So once we've identified what projects or activities may qualify as R&D, the next step is to identify the qualified expenses. Those fall under three general categories. Uh, wages, this is in the form of your employees form W-2 box one wages. Um, you determine the percentage or proportion of time an, an employee was engaged in R&D during a year. And you can include that um, relative proportion or percentage of their wages in the credit. Uh, also from the wages side, we have, um, we can include pass-through income subject to self-employment tax for owners if they are involved in R&D activities. So for um, those who are in LLCs or partnerships where owners are not receiving wages, um, the income to those owners can be included in, as a form of wages. Qualified expenses also include supplies, uh, which are the raw materials. So this could be um, new rootstock, um, or if you're more on the processing end, the you know, raw organic materials that you're using um, to make your food products. Consumables, so this would not necessarily be the organic materials, but any other consumables um, that, you, that you go through in the course of development of your, project, of your product or process. And then also customized or modified equipment. Um, we can also, you can also include contractor expenses. Um, this is just contractors who are also performing qualified activities. So if they are um, assisting with, with design development, um, testing, uh, construction of customized or modified equipment, installation, uh, we can, contractor expenses can be included um, so long as it meets additional criteria, which is the first, that the tax must, taxpayer must be at risk in that agreement with their contractor, which is to say that um, the contractor will be paid regardless of the success of the project. And the second is that the taxpayer has, must retain substantial rights. Uh, so this work is being perf performed by the contractor on the taxpayer's behalf. Um, they retain any rights to any IP that might result of it. They retain rights to use the design or the process that is developed by the contractor. And so long as they uh, meet those two criteria, we could potentially include the qualified contractor expenses. Now, this being said, there are some excluded items. Um, foreign labor, whether it's internal or external, 
um, does not qualify uh, software expenses in the form of uh, software purchases would not qualify. However, if you were contracting a software engineer to develop custom software, um, that could qualify as a contractor expense. Non-customized equipment, um, and then additional overhead type items, payroll taxes, land, rental, um, things of that nature that are not directly related to the R&D activities. So once you have identified the qualified projects and the qualified costs, um, then hopefully you have a, a R&D credit that can be calculated. But as important as it is to identify the qualified costs, it's also important to substantiate and document um, how those qualified costs are identified and that the related activities are in fact qualified under the R&D credit. Um, the R&D credit is an item that the IRS um, scrutinizes, and there is a requirement that taxpayers can support that they that their activities do in fact qualify. So some items of documentation include payroll records. Um, this would be your your W-2 amount, uh, time tracking or time surveys, so that you can allocate employee time by project and therefore calculate the qualified wages by project. General ledger expense detail for those. Um, supply and contractor expenses. Um, old tax returns, this is because uh, one of the methods for the R&D credit calculation um, looks at gross receipts from prior years. Contracts with your customers or vendors, and this is uh, because uh, it, you need to support that the taxpayer or you, your company, um, are the appropriate party to be claiming those R&D activities and the related expenses and not that it is the um, their client or their subcontractor who should who should have the right to claim those credits. Uh, project lists, um, this would be the starting point for documenting the support for your R&D activities. Uh, project notes, describing those activities, describing the technical uncertainties encountered and the process of experimentation that was that was gone through, design documents, um, a picture can speak a thousand words. Email communication, uh, this again just helps to support um, the, de the development process and supports in particular technical uncertainty. Um, and again, pictures of the improvements to projects and processes. These are all items that um, we strongly recommend are gathered and retained if your company will be claiming an R&D credit. So, okay, we're doing okay on time. Um, we want to go through a couple case studies. Star, did you have any case studies in, in particular that you wanted to share? You there? Yep, I'm here. Uh, no, I, I think okay. if you, the ones you have on here are great. Okay. Um, so, I'd like to run through from sort of grower to end processor. Um, just some examples to, to demonstrate the broad uh, depth of activities that could qualify for the R&D credit. So let's take apples, for example. Um, from the growers end, we have uh, development of new products. Uh, those of you in the industry, I know are very excited about Cosmic Crisp. There was a lot of R&D that went into development of the Cosmic Crisp. Um, how but, but, but then with new products, you also are evaluating your, um, your irrigation techniques, planting techniques, harvesting, fertigation. Um, you know, what, what chemicals are you going to be using to um, you know, alleviate pests or fertilize the plants? Are you going to be using chemicals? Are you using alternative methods? Um, I think of, I know one of the recent trends is to move away from the um, picturesque apple tree um, that is very you know rounded and and bush like to more of a flattened tree um, similar to a vineyard there's a lot of development that went into that how is that going to impact yield uh, does it make it easier to harvest 
even things like covering materials to protect the apples from the sun. Um, are they gonna need those covering materials earlier in the year? Is there a way that we can apply those covering materials more efficiently if we um, flatten the apples along a trellis as opposed to having individual trees? Uh, so those are all um, R&D activities from the growers end. Then we go to the processors where you have your um, sanitization <laughs> systems and processes, your sorting equipment, your packing equipment, the software um, in coordinating that equipment, in tracking your inventory. We've seen a lot of development um, in, the, in the processing and packaging equipment area, particularly moving towards automation um, and away from processes that were formerly done by hand uh, due to labor shortages. And then through to processing. Um, so you have the apple. How are we going to turn the apple to apple sauce? or sliced apples, or an apple pastry. Um, what is, what's the best, best method to do that? Um, what additives or treatments might we need to apply? Um, is, there a, is there new equipment or a modification to our equipment that would reduce our maintenance and downtime so that we can increase our throughput um, and our volume of production? All considerations um, that indicate that your company might be engaging in R&D. And, we'll, and we see very similar activities um, in the hop industry, growers, processors, through to the brewers, um, similar in with wineries and distilleries. Um, so those are some, not to get into too much in specifics, but uh, some examples of R&D activities throughout the agribusiness industry. Lydia, I'll jump in just for so a minute. Oh, sure. sorry, Lenny. We are um, okay. we're running out of time here, but I just want to reiterate that really the R&D in the food and agriculture industry has been very prominent um, as of late with the increase in automation and, and just really an investment in technology. And so if you if you are doing those things, I think it makes sense to reach out and, and consult with an R&D professional on, on seeing how much of that can qualify for the credit. Um, we're going to go through the risks and... Uh, Important part of the of the process, but I think we'll have to skip to the the poll question for today. And if you have any questions, and for those of you who have questions, we will get back to you on those after the. Do so you want to take it to the next poll question, Libby? Okay, sure. So the poll Great. question is. Okay, there you go, Emily. Thank you. Uh, our final polling question. Which factors may increase audit risk? And your options are A, amended returns to claim credits, B, insuff insufficient time tracking, C, executive compensation claimed as R&D, or D, all of the above. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you'll be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. Let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Liddy, back to you. Thanks, Emily. Um, so all of you are speed readers because you did correctly uh, identify that, that those three items do increase audit risk. Um, if you have any concerns or would like us to help you evaluate your company's R&D credit opportunities um, and the potential audit risk at, or and methods to perhaps mitigate that risk, uh, please please reach out. And Emily, I think you were going to lead us in some Q&A, so I know we're over on time. Yes, so we are a couple minutes over, so we won't have time for questions today. However, if you still have questions for our presenters, uh, their contact info is in the speaker bios widget, um, and you can still answer, or sorry, ask questions in the Q&A window underneath the slide view. Uh, if you had a question that we didn't answer today, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. And thank you so much to today's presenters for a great presentation. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window to the right of the slide view.
If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us.